welcome one and all. Uh, I've got to thank Simon and Chris who are at the back. Um, hands up, come on. That's it, Simon and Chris. Pelican Ag is the UK's only sustainable food venture capitalist organisation. They're interested in agri-tech. They're interested in sustainability and developing some of the technologies that are going to get us A, more sustainable, but B, to that sort of net zero, 2040, 2030, depending on who you listen to and who you watch. Uh, my name is Oliver McIntyre. I'm from Barclays Agriculture. Um, we have a, a long history in agriculture. goes back nearly 300 years. And I think for me, my sort of background is born on a, bought up on a small family farm in Lancashire. Um, don't move the microphone. There's a tip. See, if I balance it there, which you told me not to do, I don't move it. But anyway. Um, so born and brought up on a small family farm in Lancashire, uh, agricultural college, managing farms, farm consultancy, and now working as the agricultural expert for Barclays UK. We've got two great speakers in person. We've got one great video. Um, I now wish I'd picked my notes up before I'd started, but I just, just before we get going, and as a distraction while I pick my notes up to make sure I get everything right, what I want you to do, because it's quite early, and you're not going to like this, but what we want is this tent much fuller than it is now. So on the count of three, I want you to all to give a massive round of applause. Can you do that for me? Because everybody out there will think something amazingly interesting is going on in that tent. Right, are we ready? One, two, three. Oh, brilliant. Oh, thank you. Yes. Guys, still room. There's still room. Yay. Brilliant. Yes. No, it's, it has got everybody looking outside, but... We've actually, we've actually scared the living daylights out of everybody and they think we're all lunatics, so I don't think that's worked very well. But it was good fun, wasn't it? So, uh, the first thing is going to be a video from Mad Agriculture, which is the USA's uh, only, probably predominant, but definitely only, Regen Agriculture Bank. And we're going to hear from Brandon first. Hey, everyone. I'm Brandon Welch, CEO and co-founder of Mad Capital. Uh, today I'm out in Shaftesbury, Vermont, uh, working with the McDougals, Jesse and Callie at Studio Hill. Uh, they have this wonderful property. You can see the, the water wagon down there for the sheep that are about to move on to their fresh pasture. Um, some awesome rolling hills out here in the Northeast United States. Uh, beautiful spot. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about what Mad Capital is, why we exist, uh, what we're here to do, and some of the, the difficulties we've seen with uh, at least farmers here in the, the U.S. context uh, have with transitioning to organic um, and to regenerative, and then also what the future of farming could look like. You know, what, what is the type of food system that we want to create? So Mad Capital, uh, we exist to accelerate the regenerative and organic revolution in agriculture. Uh, we are aiming to become the go-to financier of regenerative organic farmers, and we want to provide uh, access to any type of capital that a farmer would need on their journey to organic and to, from organic to regenerative organic. Uh, we don't want money to be a barrier. We think that uh, the way that kind of the old guard, the incumbent financiers have shown up uh, has, has been... Uh, pretty slow. Um, it's been pretty turbulent and they haven't come up with the types of financing that farmers truly need to see in order to effectively transition land. You know, specifically on the organic transition, it's really difficult because it takes 36 months from the last application of a prohibited substance. During that time, you're pulling that chemical uh, plug that the soil has been depending on, you know, those inputs that it's been needing to function. Um, and kind of almost even act as like a hydroponic medium. And during that time, what we see with the growers that we work with, and the, this, these are growers in the upper Midwest of the United States, typically growing uh, staple crop commodities, um, also working on reperennialization re with livestock. Um, so these are corn, beans, oats, alfalfa, yellow peas, edible dry beans. During that transition, we see a lot of producers losing about anywhere from 30 to 40 percent below the break-even point uh, on those transitional acres. Um, that's, that's because you have a yield drag 
um, and you're getting conventional prices, which are pretty hard to, to make work when conventional profit margins are only on the order of, you know, two to 5% here in the U.S., unless you have some sort of a extreme advantage, uh, which many people don't have access to. Um, so we, we at Mad Capital really focus around that transition period. That's what we've done to date. Um, in the future, um, over the next three or four months, we're also gonna be releasing a few different types of uh, lending products that we think are gonna provide a more comprehensive suite to meet uh, growers' needs on their uh, transitions. Uh, those are really oriented around access to land, uh, so mortgages, down payment assistance, uh, a land equity model, so a land fund to help people build equity in their land instead of the kind of lease to own models, which um, we don't have to get into, but talk about, they, they basically create a perpetual um, kind of flywheel where people are always saving and trying to have enough uh, capital to have a down payment on their land, but they're never quite able to build that capital base as fast as the appreciation of the land. So we need to come up with a new model for access to land. Um, infrastructure, we really wanna help um, create more decentralized systems uh, that are run by people within those communities uh, that create a, a more robust um, ability to, you know, weather transitions, just like we had uh, during COVID. You know, when that, when that spike came in, we have these large meat processing facilities, grain processing here, uh, here in the U.S. that had shut down and create all sorts of uh, food shortages. Whereas if we had a more of a decentralized web of processing throughout the country, we could have avoided um, a lot of those hiccups. So that's what we're focused on is helping people transition. Uh, we really want to create, you know, a, a system that is aligned with the natural principles of the earth. And we want to create financing um, that's also aligned with that, aligned with uh, long-term patient nature, you know, moving from the human time frame and time scale to a more natural one. We don't need to get to geological, <laughs> but we can get somewhere in between that actually so it makes, uh, makes more sense uh, for growing food. You know, we're looking at more of the three to five to 10 year basis uh, versus kind of the single year mindset that's pretty extractive in nature and pretty difficult um, to constantly have a turn on without the system eventually dwindling and not functioning, you know, as you'd, as you'd like it to see. Um, so we really, we really wanna create financing that, you know, embodies the circularity um, and balance that we see in natural systems. Um, so we're working really hard to do that to date, have worked with and financed over the last year since February, 2021, uh, we closed a $10 million fund financing uh, 20 growers, transitioning 7,000 acres of farmland to organic and working with a total of uh, 41,000 acres um, across about 11 or 12 states. Um, along the way, uh, beyond financing being a a key barrier on people's transition. We've also seen that access to the right types of knowledge and technical assistance has also been pretty difficult. Um, so making sure that you can have advice that's really curated to the ecological context of your place, like where I am today, much of the advice and principles, you know, the principles may apply, um, you know, reducing, reducing disturbance, keeping the ground covered, um, adding diversity, those principles might apply, but the specifics are very different here than they would be, you know, in Colorado where, where I live. Um, here we're looking at 45, 50 inches of rain. Colorado, um, in Boulder, we get about 18 inches of rain a year. Um, those are very different systems and to have the right type of advice that can span those systems uh, is difficult. Uh, that's where we're building a network of different consultants in order to provide place based knowledge and design um, instead of just trying to take the cookie cutter approach and blanket everyone with the same type of information. The third difficult area that we've seen on people transitioning uh, is access to the right types of markets. Um, you can only grow what you can sell and if you don't have access to the right types of markets and you can't get a premium, you can't uh, reduce some of that um, market volatility and have a longer term contract that you're confident in that's reliable and it's going to be there. Uh, it's pretty difficult to have the confidence to transition land to organic uh, because it takes more time. It's it's a new system. Uh, it it can be difficult for some. So we have a 
under the MAD umbrella. We have a MAD markets team that works on both brokerage, so working from our growers uh, up the supply shed, down the supply shed, uh, to larger brands and CPGs that are willing to pay you know, a fair price for the crops that our growers are producing. And then we also work as originators, so working up the supply shed and sourcing through our networks the growers who are in the place that can produce um, the ecologically appropriate ingredient that that um, buyer might be looking for. So I'm coming up short on time here, um, so I'll try to keep it tight. Uh, what does the future of farming look like? Um, the future, the system that I would like to see um, is one that is chemical free, it's organic, uh, it embodies circularity, it takes care of people, it takes care of the planet, um, and it also mindfully uses technology to help reduce a lot of those inefficiencies that we see uh, throughout the ag system right now. And it doesn't necessarily replace, uh, it's not going to replace people on the land. People will always be an integral part of managing the land, but we can use technology to help optimize um, a lot of the systems and to help them flourish and to help them produce healthy food for people. Um, we, I, I wanna get in the car in Boulder and drive to Chicago, which is about a thousand miles away. And I don't wanna see any corn or soybean plants. Um, I wanna see a windshield full of bugs and I wanna see a whole host of different crops out my window. And I wanna see livestock roaming the landscape. Um, that is not the case right now, uh, but it is a future that we're working towards. And it's one that to be clear is an inevitable it's one that we have to fight for and it's one that's going to be difficult uh, to get to but i do see hope i think conferences like this um, are are the lighthouses on the hill that are attracting people um, and i hope and i think if if we all lean in and we keep at it um, we can get there so if that's the future that we're trying to create um, i hope you are too thanks for your time today have a good one bye That's a, a much better round of applause that won't scare the living daylights out of everybody who was walking past. I've never seen so many petrified people walking past. It's, um, it's interesting to hear Brandon's view on that. I suppose Barclays has a sort of 25% market share. So we have everything from some of the biggest agri-food businesses in the UK to the smallest upland tenant farmers uh, and, and everything in between. We have organic, we have people doing regen, we have people doing mint-till. And I think Sometimes, for the what you might call the more mainstream agricultural world, Regen Ag sounds scary. Organic probably sounds even scarier. Um, certainly, some of the schemes that are coming out at the moment, Elms and what have you, uh, I think there's a lot of wariness out there amongst some mainstream farmers. But I've just been making a list while Brandon was talking. You know, things like nutrient budgeting, the value of manure, controlled trafficking to prevent compaction, the value of organic matter and soil structure, livestock as part of an arable rotation, um, struggling to read my own writing now because I didn't have a flat, uh, flat piece to write on, herd health plans in dairy farms, you know, uh, rotations of crops, microorganisms and, and worms in soil is an important part of it, soil erosion, um, and I, I think to myself, you can see why a lot of mainstream farmers might be a little bit scared of all those phrases, but actually, I know I don't look old enough, but 35 years ago this year, I went to Ag College, and they were all things our lecturers taught us at Ag College 35 years ago. There's nothing new in Regen. We just need to... Oh, this is going to be bad. I was going to say regenerate Regen, but no, we won't go there. We'll get another speaker on before I bore you all rigid. Uh, next speaker is Sinna. She is representing No Fence, which is a very good explanation of the business, but I'll let her do it even better. Well, thank you, trying to find the distance to the microphone, it's a challenge, isn't it? Yes, my name is Sinna, and I'm uh, representing No Fence. So we do virtual fencing. Um, so instead of putting up, putting up physical infrastructure, you put a collar on an animal, you put a pasture in an app on your phone, it gives the cow an audio signal when it crosses the boundary, and then they learn to turn around because they don't want to get an electric pulse. So when I talk about it, I normally because people get skeptical straight away. But I normally say the difference between that and standard electric fencing is that instead of the cow seeing an electric fence and avoiding touching it, we're talking about a cow listening. 
So we're just utilizing, utilizing a different sense of the animal. And it's really effective. So we have a, we started, or Oscar started, who's here, he started in the 90s. Um, and the company was established in 2011. So that's a good 11 years of virtual fencing. Uh, and I think the, the sort of start of no fence was really about Oscar being tired of fencing because it's limiting, it's hard work, uh, and there is so much land in Norway that you sort of, you know, you, you, you just can't fence it. You can imagine fencing where Oscar lives is the fjord, and then it's 1,000 meters on that side, 1,000 meters on that side. You, you think your woodlands are thick over here. They're not. Yeah. So for Norwegian farmers, it's been you know, a technology that allows them to access these vast amounts of land and they can stretch their season. In Norway, what's really running costs in livestock farming is your winter feeds. So if you can stretch your season, maybe in both ends, it's a proper cut on your expenses. And then we come along to this country, which was our sort of first step outside of Norway. Uh, and as uh, Oscar puts it, little did I know what the technology could be used for. And that, I think, is the, the really exciting thing of work which we're moving into at this point is the regenerative, managed cell mob grazing. You've put so many terms on it. Um, but anyways, the best side of no fence is the dynamic side of things. So you can move fences um, and without having to go in the field and, and move them physically. So I have spoken to farmers on the phone who are into either have livestock in arable rotation or are rotating um, animals on grassland. And they're saying, I spend five hours a day during the summer moving fences. And we can take that down to 20 seconds, which is a massive, massive change. And uh, we see the sort of spillover effects of, uh, you know, farmers' welfare. Um, because farmers have more time, which I think we as a society have neglected that they, we just accept that they work for 14 hour days and, and we really shouldn't. We have a theory that we're going to have a generation of no fence kids because farmers have got more time on their hands now. <laughs> I think we'll see that. Um, so anyways, yeah, and it's, it's really interesting for us to, to be at Groundswell and I think see the synergies and, and, um, if I would encourage anything, it's, um, it's not a thing, single thing that we can do. It's, I don't think you're going to find something, a magic product that can solve all the issues that we're in front of. But I think we need to work together and, and look at the whole journey and, and yeah, utilize the network of people that are doing the right things and, and um, yeah, share with each other, get better. Excellent. Thank you, Sina. Good work. Good work. I am gonna, I'm going to break my neck on this lead before the day's out, I can assure you. We're going to do some... I've got a few questions that have come up just from what you said, Sina. Um, we're going to do some Q&A after. We've heard from Joe from the Soil Exchange... It's, ugh, trying to say Soil Exchange platform. But uh, I'll, I'll just be quiet. Joe. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to see so many of you in real life. I feel this is a kind of a room filled with the kind of visions of Zoom of the last year. Uh, so nice to see real faces. Uh, I'm Joseph Gridley from Soil Association Exchange, uh, and we're a new, a new business that started about a year ago, um, but spun out of a charity that's been going for a very, very long time. So many of you might know the Soil Association. We started about 75 years ago, um, perhaps best known for, for setting organic standards. Uh, in farming, I guess a, a precursor in many ways to, to the regen movement. Uh, and about 18 months ago, we got confronted with a bit of a problem. One, that organic was seen as quite divisive in the UK. It was stubbornly stuck at about 2-3% of farmers. And there was this huge positivity about farming in a more regenerative way. Um, and we weren't able to, I guess, reach those farmers. And then there was all these other things, um, you know, Climate change was front of mind for farmers and for retailers and processors. Uh, BPS was coming to an end. Uh, farmers were looking for new income streams onto their farm. And we thought, you know, given our experience in sustainable farming over the last 75 years, maybe there was something we could do to, to help. 
Uh, and so we built Exchange. Uh, and at its simplest, it's a way to help any, any farm, organic, conventional, regenerative, whatever it might be, to actively measure uh, how their farm is impacting on the environment. Um, so to get real clear science-based outcome measurements of how a particular set of farming practices is changing soils, water, biodiversity, animal welfare, a whole raft of different things. Once a farmer's got that data, uh, really clear data, uh, they can use that to uh, you know, um, get better deals uh, from the people they sell their products to, to learn about what they might be able to do uh, to improve their farm. Uh, but what we help them with is getting advice. So once you know where you are, once you know the state of your soils, um, there are actions that you can take. Once you know how your biodiversity is, uh, there are actions you can take. So we've got a team of agricultural advisors that are out across the country uh, helping farmers to get this data and then to improve. And our hunch, and this is slowly starting to be borne out, is that as farms improve, as biodiversity increases, as the health of their soils increase, um, this is not only a nice thing for nature and climate and things like this, but it's also increasingly becoming a great thing uh, for the bottom line of a farmer's bank balance. Um, we're seeing new examples every week of retailers, processors, banks, investors that are willing to pay money for farms that are demonstrating um, progress, on, progress on ecological health whether that be things like carbon markets, which are a bit contentious, perhaps, right through to things like um, supermarkets paying better prices for you know, milk that comes with biodiversity and carbon benefits on the top. Um, we've been going about a year, like I said, uh, so still early stages. We've put a lot of our focus in these early, early months into getting the science right. Uh, we partnered with an organization called Natural Capital Research, some of the best scientists that can kind of understand how ecology works on a farm uh, and worked with them to create a really rigorous methodology to measure a farm's sustainability. Um, but we know that if you make it too hard, no one's ever going to do it. And so we've really maximized lots of existing technologies, audio recognition, image recognition, DNA sequencing, lots of things to basically fast track it. So in one day, a farmer can get a really, really clear science-based picture of how all these different ecological processes are working on their farm. Um, we've also put a lot of focus into building a big network. Uh, we feel we can't do this if we're just the small organic people. Uh, and so we've got big relationships with high street banks, uh, with some of the big retailers like Sainsbury's and M&S, um, some of the processors like Arla and AVP. Uh, and we're really trying to build a momentum. So there's a standard way um, that farmers can understand um, what, what regeneration actually looks like. Not in a greenwash way, but in a kind of real science-based numbers way. Um, we'll be testing with about 150 farms over the coming, coming months. Uh, and we'd love to you know, test it on some of your farms. Um, you know, we're in testing phase, so it's even free for you. Um, so yeah, it'd uh, be a pleasure to, to talk to some of you later. Thank you, Joe. I think, I think by my count, Joe, you mentioned high street banks four times. I've, I've done a, do a lot of stuff like this. I've never had someone try to sell me something during their presentation, Joe, but we have talked and we will talk again, no doubt. So we've got a good 20 minutes, maybe even 25 minutes for some questions. I'm going to try with my bad hearing to hear you if you want to say something. I suppose while people are thinking, oh, we've got a, ro a roving mic. It's better than down to earth last week. There was no roving mic there. Um, I suppose a question for me, you mentioned it and touched on it, Joe. Soil Association, very much, you know, the organic farming side of it and regulation. What's, how are you finding that non-organic farmers, conventional farmers are interacting with you? Are you doing any of your trials and pilots on, on more uh, conventional farming systems? Yeah, great question. Um, and, I mean, the simple answer is this is very, very specifically for all farmers. Uh, and, you know, for the last 15 years or so, the Soil Association has been doing lots of work with non-organic farmers. Uh, but this is a real step in that direction. So more than 50% of the farms we're piloting with are, are conventional. And what we're hearing is, you know, there's definitely some 
there's some historical connotations of who the Soil Association are, for sure. Um, but a lot of those are quite positive. They know us as the, the sustainable farming people, the people that got a lot of this regen stuff early on. Um, but we're also keen that we've got to distance ourselves from some of the maybe you know, less helpful things we said in the past uh, so that we can build a movement that any farmer can feel like they're a part of. Excellent, thanks. And Sina, for me, sounds fascinating. I love the idea of a warning sign before you're about to get a little bit of a, uh, a pulse. What sort of area, because obviously the fjords of Norway and the uplands of Scotland and the north of England, I could see it being a really useful management tool, like you say. And, uh, uh, I lost track of the amount of fences you see in the uplands that are just no longer there anymore. What sort of area, I'm quite interested in you know, talking about livestock as part of an arable rotation and you get down into the south, southeast, a lot of the field boundaries are in the condition to take livestock. What sort of area can you tighten no fence down into? Oh, it's, it's um, I normally say, you know, when we train, because you have to think a little bit differently about your fencing when you're using no fence. Um, and I would say, I normally say to, to farmers all the time that, you know, an animal takes about a week to learn. Farmers take a lot longer. Yeah. So it's about adjusting your mindset because I think we're all used to fences as being a sort of fixed line um, uh, in a field, but a GPS is not going to be fixed. So there is two variations. There is a variation on the GPS and that, that accuracy is down to one to two meters. So you can actually graze quite accurately. Um, but then there is another factor, which is obviously the audio, which is key because the audio gives the animals the predictability and the ability to turn around and avoid the poles, which is what we need. So um, I always say to farmers, you know, leave it a little bit further back when you get started, and then you'll quite clearly, you'll see the grazing line appear. I had a farmer the other week, and he, um, after four days, he saw the grazing line appear, and, and after that, you know, you learn how to adjust your boundary, and it's also a lot down to individual character of cows. You see those that are exploring it all the time and those that are behind, so yeah. Like, like life, some people press the boundary, some people don't. Yeah. Is it worthwhile? Do you have to put them into some sort of training area? I used to, my last jobs in agriculture were outdoor pig units and you didn't just put pigs into an electric fence paddock, you put them in a training area. Is that, is that an advisable thing? Yes, definitely. So we do recommend training the animals and, and every time you say that to a farmer, they're like, whoa, that sounds like a lot of work. And, but it's not. So um, all we recommend is keeping them in a field that's physically fenced because they, they tend to give a little bit of a bounce the first time they get a pulse. Uh, but then they quickly learn the associations and then they learn, oh, I actually need to turn around to avoid it. And the key thing is farmers have all the data on the training so they can compare the number of audios to the number of pulses. So you'll quickly see that animals are, you know, audios are going up, which is fine, because every time we have an audio but no pulse, it means animals are, are fenced. means it's worked. Do we have any questions from the floor? We do. See, you're not, you're not in vain with, the, with your roving mic. Thanks very much. So now, it's not so much a question, but really, uh, you, I don't think you sold your product well enough. People forget that... Old fencing is, is, is everything you say, it's bad. We, we've removed 28 kilometers of fencing on 2,600 acres in Wiltshire. And we think that the solution is electric fencing, but it's not. Firstly, you have to top around the field. So that takes grazing away and it costs money. Then you've got the problem of theft. Theft of your batteries, theft of the actual electric fencing. And the other thing which people don't realize is if you have a disruptive system whether it be electric or main, you break the pattern of the natural movement of animals on the farm, the natural thing. So it has a massive impact on the well-being of your wildlife. Obviously, in, in a traditional fence, you get deer caught in them. It's tragic. We were finding maybe one a month caught up in fencing, and that's gone now. But the electric fence also stops animals moving from A to B. And what people forget is that the big animals create the pathways. The small animals follow those paths. So... I, I was unaware of, of your product, but it has implications way beyond possibly what, what, uh, what you realize. Thank you. Yeah, and no, I think that's, that's sorry, a, a very, very good, good comment. And, and that's what we see as well. And, and um, you know, we, we hear from customers all the time that they, they start off with no fence, and then it takes a year and they realize, oh, I can actually take my manure out without 
opening the gate every time. Just simple stuff like that that you don't realize. But I think the key thing for it to be communicated out to customers in a good sort of marketing way is that it comes from farmers. So farmers have to tell other farmers that, oh, I've seen all these spillover benefits um, and, and it's really good. But yeah, we need to get the conversation going. Joe, you look like you were diving in there. Or are you? No, I was going to say, you've clearly got a new job, but no fence. Yeah. You know. yeah. so after a discount before yeah. the show's yeah. out, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Um, good man, good man, nothing wrong with that. Joe, what, what sort of, you talked a bit about the platform, what sort of data are you going to have available? What sort of uh, information are you going to feed in? Because I shouldn't, I, should, I, promised, I promised legal and compliance, I wouldn't answer any questions, but, and I wouldn't talk too much, but I, I just know working in the bank, if you put rubbish data in, you tend to get rubbish out. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is something we've struggled with, and we know, you know, Similar to No Fence, we've built this all with farmers from the ground up. And the, the thing that farmers hate most is, is duplicating of data entry, data entry in general. Uh, and so you end up with a lot of rubbish. So what, the way we've built it is by trying to automate as much of this as possible. Um, so we've got data feeds from existing places where farmers have put information into, things like certification, things like um, carbon toolkits they might have done, carbon certifications they've done in the past. We can take a lot of that stuff. Uh, we also use a lot of satellite imagery. Uh, so, you know, that's not good for everything, but it's a great starting place. It gives you a sense of habitat breakdown, of proximity to waterways, uh, of soil type and things like this, which all help with a farm's kind of ecological score. Um, and then the final bit, uh, which we feel is really important, is... Accuracy comes from actually being on a farm. You can't, you can't predict, you can't model any of this stuff because every farm is so different. Uh, and so we really spend a lot of time. We put two, two people out onto every farm for a day and they go around and they dig holes and they count birds and they collect uh, invertebrate pan traps and they test waterways. Uh, and it's that rigor of having real people that are trained taking this data in that means we can end up with a, a really comprehensive ecological score of a, of a farm. And then presumably, do you, do you add in, does the farmer add in rotations, livestock, period of time on a field? Culti you know, this is an ama amazing kit out in that direction. The type of cultivation that's taken place? Exactly, yeah. So we, when we arrive on the farm, we, we kind of split. So there's a technician that goes out and does a lot of the manual tests, the birds, the soils, and things like that. And then the agriculture advisor sits down over a cup of tea and gets into a lot of those conversations with the farmer. What have you been doing on these fields for the last five years? What kit are you using? What might you be spraying, et cetera, et cetera? Because that all builds up the picture, not only of the, the, I guess, the score, the ecological score, but also what advice can come off the back of it. Excellent. Yeah, and presumably that's how, you know, that's going to enable regen because you can start off quite small and then you can start seeing the good that you're doing, the soil carbon, organic matter you're building, and then it becomes like a, a snowball effect sometimes, doesn't it? Um, do we have any more questions from the floor? Oh, right at the back. Oh, the, no, 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 I wanted, I wanted to see, I, no, I wanted him to run from the back for that. Um, so, Oliver, just in terms of your experience with the traditional farmer, can you give us a bit of colour around what the conversations are like in beginning to introduce new technologies that could usher in the new age of Regenag? Yeah, I think it's, it's quite interesting. I think there was a survey out a couple of months ago, and I th it, it always strikes me in agriculture, whenever they do a survey on anything, it's always a third, a third, a third. So there's a third of farms out there who uh, are on the sustainability journey. They're on the net zero journey. They're really pushing on, and they're at the sort of forefront of it. Um, and though the range of those farms is everything from some of the biggest growers in East Anglia with big supply contracts into some of the companies that we've already mentioned. So they've got to be all over it because they're getting pressure off their processor or retailer. Um, the middle third know they've got to do something but they're not exactly sure exactly what they should be doing, and they don't know how Elms and Sustainable Farming's incentive is going to fit in with that. And then there's that other third that aren't just engaged at all at the minute. Um, and again, the range of people, I've been on large-scale dairy farms in the last few months that um, 
don't want to talk about greenhouse gas, methane, nitrous oxide, emissions, carbon, or anything else. They want to talk about genetics and how many litres they're getting a cow. And for me, I think it's a bit of a worry because they've got a supply contract with a large processor. And for us as a banking organisation, you know, we put money out for 20, 25 years, which um, I, I try and do some mental maths as a banker now, but definitely takes us beyond the NFU's target of 2040 or nearly, uh, nearly to the 2050 target. So actually, as bankers, if we're sitting there having a conversation about long-term investment in land or infrastructure on a dairy farm or something like that, we need to know that farm's on the journey of regenerative agriculture, heading towards net zero, heading towards sustainability. Because otherwise, those bigger processes are going to turn around in, could be anything, couldn't it? Could be five or six years and say, actually, you're not starting. Your contract's ended. And we saw it a bit with the, some of the milk contracts that came out, the aligned milk contracts 15 years ago. Everybody jumped in. And actually, it took about 10 years. But eventually, some of those milk contracts started to push out the lower performers at the bottom to let people in who were more efficient producers. And a lot of those aligned contracts were one of the first sort of supplier chains that actually introduced uh, carbon audits as part of their supply contract because they could see all this coming. So it's, it's interesting conversations. As, as a bank, we are um, obsessed with sustainability at the moment, not only from our perspective, you know, our own carbon footprint as an organisation, but also from that of our clients. So going back to that dairy farmer analogy of wanting two or three million quid to expand the dairy unit, we need to know that the carbon footprint of that debt that goes out is actually going to be reducing and getting towards net zero. Otherwise, we're going to have to answer to the FCA and the Bank of England uh, about that. So it is, um, it's an interesting concept in some farm kitchens. In others, it's a great conversation to have because they realise that we're trying to have that conversation too. About two years ago, we bought in, uh, it was a flood risk assessment, and all the banks had to do it under the FCA. And our managers were really worried about going to our biggest clients and saying, you do know you're at risk of rising sea levels and flood. And they said, I don't want to have this conversation with a client. And actually, they all came back and said, what a brilliant conversation. The client was either fully aware of it and wanted to talk to someone about it, or they hadn't really taken into account, but having the conversation actually sparked the, hold on a minute, what would I do if sea level rises? What would I do if the, the flood uh, comes and ruins my farm? Anyway, moral of this tale is never ask me a question when I've got a microphone because I'll talk for ages. Um, do we have any more questions from the floor? So it's about quarter two. Uh, never want to drag... Whoa, missed, missed. Excellent. Sorry, just a quick question. Um, Joe... Which accreditation standards are you working towards and how do you see that area of the market evolving? Yeah, great question. Um, so at the moment, uh, the way we've done it, there's no particular accreditation standard because it doesn't, it doesn't exist. There's no kind of whole farm ecology score, um, but it's something that we're really interested in. And so all of the protocols we're building to measure this stuff can be audited. Uh, so they're following the best possible science uh, doing the best possible things, and they can be checked. So we've got balances, people going out to check that this data is is correct in the hope that we can get it to, 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 to be accredited, uh, to have a kind of standardised outcome measurement thing for, for regenerative agriculture. And it's, a, it's a really good question. We have in numerous conversations about carbon markets, measuring carbon, depends who you speak to. There are measurements out there but whether they're at an audit, auditable level for income, for bank lending even, is, is a really interesting conversation. And let's not even start on measuring natural capital because that's a nightmare. I think we've got another question on the right. Yeah, just a small one um, on the no fence. Suckler cows, calves, at what stage can you start to either train the calves, which obviously is a slight of a problem area for us with lots of busy roads around? Yep. So we normally have, we don't recommend, if you have suckler herds with calves on foot, we don't recommend putting a collar on the calves until they get independent. The earliest I've seen that is at six months. We have or are developing a product for calves. So you can, if you have calves on their own, you can virtually fence them. They, they learn really well. But a benefit that we've actually seen from the no fence system and rotational grazing or strip grazing with calves 
is that the calves get the opportunity to creep graze in front of the cows. Um, so we actually had a customer saying, because he had four different systems, and, and one of them was no fence, and the other were traditional electric fencing. Uh, and he told us that the calves with no fence, because they had the ability to creep graze, they gained 17 kilos more than the other calves, which is quite sort of a spillover effect we didn't even know about. Fabulous, fabulous. And where's my... He's, he's disappeared, roving Mike, man. Come on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to say it. I hope that is rain. Could do with a bit of rain. Um, that very specific question about the no fence. Are there limits to how small the, the actual area can be? Or do the cows potentially get confused if you're doing like an intensive mob grazing system and they, they don't know where the boundary is or they quickly learn? Oh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. So I think uh, my first answer to that is always no fence is very, very flexible. But we as farmers have to realize that we're dealing with nature. So we have to keep in mind that animals are going to move within these boundaries and that it's understandable for them. And the sort of, we can actually have quite tight pasture, but as you say, if it's too tight, what happens is the animal meets the boundary on one side, turns around to avoid it, meets another one again. Um, and I normally say we don't have a sort of minimum on the, on the, the fence because we want farmers to make that call. We want them to be out there in the field and see how do my animals behave and, and are they doing all right? Because you'll have animals who can, who can deal with tighter pastures than others. Um, as an example, in Norway, it's become quite good, good business to run goats on the power lines with no fence. And I think there we've sort of been down to, to 25 meters between the, the boundaries. But again, give animals access to what they need. So if they need shelter, water, and enough feed, that's, um, that's the key. Excellent. Is there a stocking density the guideline that goes with it? Because we're obsessed with grazing livestock units in the UK. We haven't set a standard. Again, I think it's something that we, uh, we really need to have the, the right people look at the stocking densities because it's um, from a technical perspective, we, we don't have a lot to, that can sort of guide us on, oh, there is that of that limit. I think it's the, the grazing management that, that should set the, the stocking density. And another question at the back. <clears throat> it's more of a sort of a theoretical question to, to Sune. Um, but uh, Joseph was talking about um, the audit function. Uh, Oliver mentioned it as well. Is it not possible uh, through no fence, through the data that you're gathering, to provide an audit trail on plan grazing and as, as a, a leap in, in terms of before we can you know, get accurate nat natural capital measurements that everyone's comfortable with and while we wait for government to catch up with innovation, um, it sounds like that's kind of an interesting idea. Definitely. And I'd say if there is a potential with no funds at this point, it is the data. So we have a flexible fencing solution, which is a giant leap to start with, but then it's all the data that we derive from it and what can we utilize it for. Um, and I think audits, it's definitely one of them. But most importantly, what we don't want to do is, is do what I feel a lot of, what we do a lot in agriculture at the moment, we go to farmers and we throw data at them. We say, oh, we can give you all this, this great data, but we need someone, we need to give farmers data that they can utilize to make their farming better. Um, and we need someone to, again, work with people who know what farmers need um, to get that data and that information right. But yeah, audits is, is easy to solve. Okay, brilliant. Any more hands up before I ask the final banker type question? Excellent. I get the last question then. So, to both of you, have you done any, like being the banker, ex farm consultant? I'm already thinking, how much does this cost and how does that compare to standard fencing and fence repairs? Really interesting that you're saying growth weight and, and daily live weight gain is up in, in suckler herds, so already there's a win there. I'm just thinking about when a farmer comes in, goes to try and finance this, should they need it, how are they going to justify borrowing that money to invest in this, Sena? Yeah, and I think that's really what we're looking into now because uh, like you say, I think we all agree that every farm is individual. 
So we have to find where can we draw the similarities between the different farms, and, and there is so much that you can you can pick up on. But again, quantifying it is the different bit, isn't it? So it's it's um, when you leap into no funds, if you go into regenerative, it's a big leap because you're taking on a new practice, and if it's not successful, it's it's high risk, isn't it? But then you look at I think it's if you look at no funds comparing it to just fence wire and poles it's it's not really there but if you look at the you can reduce your fertilizer you can reduce your concentrate like we say about the cast creep grazing uh, we had a farmer who went from set stock to managed grazing around the river um, and he he managed to to send them off for finishing two months earlier so again you're cutting feed and and water management you know it's um yeah. It, if you put it, all of it in there. And that early finishing is something that really comes to the fore. It's a big issue in the beast sector at the minute yeah. as well. Joe, 150 farms were free. <laughs> where, do you, where do you... You might not have got to that point yet, but where? what are the ongoing costs of this? Because this is something, actually, you know, I've talked about natural capital from a banking perspective is just a, a, a shoulder shrug at the minute for us. Um, where, where do you see it sort of price pointing or have you not got that far because this is actually something that banks could work with as, as you've already alluded to to say actually this farms you know its productivity is lower but look at the good it's doing from from a point of natural capital yeah so we're, we're early stage i wouldn't say we've got a perfect business model at the moment but a few a few thoughts on where we are one is we sit in this nice place of we're a we're a social enterprise so we're we're doing this for the good that it delivers and not to, to make money from farmers. So the pricing is always going to reflect that. The second thing is we want a version of this to be affordable, free to any farmer um, so that they can start to use this and get their head around some of this information to get this, this sustainability ec ecological data. Um, where a farmer wants it to be verified so they can get paid for it, where they need us to put boots on the ground to, to check things, that's where it starts to kick in. Uh, and at the moment, it's, it's about £1,500 or something like that for us to do a full verified checks and for you to get the, for you to get the, the agriculture advice. Which actually, 1500 quid could be the best 1500 quid you spend, couldn't it? Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. I want to say uh, thank you to Simon and Chris from Pelican Ag. Uh, wish you every success in the future because we need you to support these agritech businesses. Uh, we'll continue our conversations, no doubt, guys. Uh, I want to thank Brandon who joined us on video because these things, having done a few videos, uh, that probably was eight minutes, probably took him, what, four and a half days? Something like that, to endless takes unless he's not as useless as I am. And, of course, many thanks to Sinner from No Fence and Joe from the Soil Association. Give him a good round of applause.